Father God, we bless your name this morning, O God. We lift up, O God, Father, your servant this morning, O God. Father, I pray, O God, for an anointing upon her right now, O God, from the crown of her head to the very soles of her feet in the mighty name of Jesus. Almighty God, I pray, Father, that God, as she speak your word, as she stand before your people this morning, O God, to feed your people, O God. I pray, Father God, that that anointing is going to flow, flow, God, that even as she begin to speak, oh God, your words will come forth, oh God, from your bosom, oh God, to your people this morning, Father, the unadulterated world with anointing and power and fire this morning, oh God. Father, we pray against every hindrances, every blockage that will be there, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we pull down those hindrances, we pull down those blockages in the minds, oh God, of your people this morning. Father, even with your servant, oh God, that there will be a free, a free flow of your spirit this morning, oh God. Father, touch our hearts, oh God. Prepare our hearts this morning to receive from you, God. Father, for it is you, your word is coming from, oh God. Father, touch our hearts, oh God, and we will receive your word this morning, oh God, and there will be fruit out of your word this morning, oh God. Cover this entire place with your blood. Cover your servant, oh God, with your blood. Lord, yes, in Jesus, Jesus' mighty name, yes, O God. Lord. We thank you thank in Jesus' you, name. Thank you, amen. Lord. Amen and amen. Amen. I just want to thank you, lay ministers, Richard and Liesl, for praying for me. And Father, Lord, I ask you, Lord, Father, as you have given me this message for your church, Lord, that you will help me to decrease, O God, and you increase in me. Father, empower me, O God. Give me the strength, O God. Father, forgive me of any sin, O God. That may be a hindrance to me bringing your word today, Lord. Father, let me be, O oh God, that vessel that you have called, O oh God, Father, to stand here and speak to your people, God. Father, we praise you. Father, I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Many of us sitting here today can say that we are saved, correct? Yes? Affirmatively, I'm not hearing a resounding. All right, nice. So I want to take us back a bit. We were all once sinners, physically alive, but spiritually dead inside. We lived a life of sin with our own thoughts, desires, and ideals, being the only moral compass by which we were determined to follow. When it came to God, our belief system, we could admit, was somewhat skewed. Some of us believed, like myself, that he existed, but in a very surface way. You know, no real depth to understanding who he was, his purpose, and our purpose as his creation. Some of us believed that there were, in fact, many versions of God. God was just not one singular being, but there were so many gods that come in so many forms. While some of us sitting here may not have even believed at all. We may not have believed that he was real, that we, hear about, we heard about this God and we thought that it was a make, a make believe being. And we used to laugh at other Christians, you know, um, why they believe in this God. But we are saved today and we believe. We probably didn't even want to hear about him in our degenerated state. We thought how we wanted, we spoke how we wanted, dressed how we wanted, treated people as we wanted, and we lived how we wanted. I just want to say, that no one can stop the power of the Almighty God. Amen. Yes, amen. In John 6, verse 65, Jesus declares that no one can come to him unless the Father draws them. Though man is born with a need for God, man does not have the ability to come to God in his natural state because his heart is hard and his mind is darkened. Therefore, it is only by the merciful and gracious drawing of God that man is saved. And this is why I say it's important for us to pray for those who we know who are not saved. They are not lost forever. You know, God, his desire is that all will come to everlasting life and that none should perish. So just as how somebody, like as you would have heard in my bio, I am one, 
I don't know, I like, if I were to probably do a timeline way back, even before the generations that I know of, I know of, it is possible that I was the only one that has been saved for many, 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 many generations. But somebody was praying for me. And I remember, actually, when I was two years old, I had a babysitter who was a born-again believer, you know, and she used to take care of me. And I'm, I, I wouldn't doubt that because of her prayers, I am here today. Right? So it's important for us to pray for those who are unsaved. Okay? Right. So in accordance with Romans 10 verse 9, we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised Christ from the dead. We are saved. At the point of salvation, we exchange the banner that we carry that says sinner and we are declared righteous by God because of our faith in Jesus Christ. This is who we are now. This is what is commonly known as justification, and I know the Bible school students would know what this means. A key passage describing justification in relation to believers is Romans 3, verse 21 to 26, which says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. At the point of salvation, then, several things occur. There is the eradication of the penalty of sin, which was death, and we read that in Romans 3, verse 23, 8, verse 1, 1 Peter 2, verse 24. There's also the restoration of God's favor, which had been lost due to our sin. We read that in John 3, verse 36. So justifica justification sorry, is more than an acquittal. It is full acceptance from the Father. He has fully accepted us. We are now friends of God. We read that in James 2 verse 23, and co-heirs with Christ, Romans 8 verse 17. The, then, thirdly, the there's an attribu attribution of righteousness, righteousness sorry, which is the putting of Christ's righteousness to our account. We read that in Romans 4 verse 5 to 8. We are declared to be righteous legally because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. So we are justified, declared righteous, and this is at salvation, at the moment of our salvation. Jesus Christ finished the work required for our justification on the cross. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? And we read that in 5, verse 9. He was then raised to life for our justification. Romans 4 verse 25. And remember, all of this is about justification, our position as, as saints. Like Joshua the priest, we have been stripped of our filthy clothes. Zechariah 3 verse 4. And like the prodigal son in the parable, we are now clothed with the best robe. Luke 15 verse 22. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God the Father sees us as perfect and unblem unblemished, and we are to be devoted to doing what is good. Titus 3 verse 14. We are no longer labeled as sinners, but he declares positionally that we have the mind of Christ. We are the light of the world, the salt of the earth, his workmanship. Chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Set apart as holy. The temple of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit dwells. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. His own special people that we may proclaim the praises of him who called us all out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Let me stress on that again. He called us all all out of darkness into his marvelous light as we hear the scripture and what the god declares us to be when we were saved 
I want us now to position ourselves today. Repeat, let me repeat the characteristics. We are no longer labeled as sinners, but he declares positionally that we have the mind of Christ. We are the lights of the world, the souls of the earth, his workmanship, chosen before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, set apart as holy, the temple of the Holy Spirit where the Holy Spirit dwells, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that we, more pro we may proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called us. But are we truly walking out of darkness? That is ignorance and sin. sin. Into his marvelous light, that is truth. After we have been saved, we must continue to be saved. Christians still struggle with the power of sin in their lives. Even though we are forgiven, we are not sinless. While on earth, we must be saved from the power of through the process of sanctification. Again, Bible school students will know this term. When we as believers initially come to faith and are set apart for God, our actions may not be much different from our actions before. It's the truth. I can tell you, when I was saved, it took me about a year before I got the revelation that party, partying was wrong, wearing certain clothes was wrong, fornication was wrong, etc., etc., etc. The list goes on. We have been positionally sanctified, but now we need to be practically sanctified. That is, we need to start living in a way that is set apart to God. We need to practice holiness. As we grow in our relationship with the Lord, our behavior should change to be more confirmed to what God desires. We will become more and more sanctified. This is often called, and we hear it a lot in this church, progressive sanctification. Apostle Paul spends chapter 1 to 3 of, Ephe of the book of Ephesians explaining how believers have been saved from the penalty of sin, which is what we spoke about before, justification. Then he urges them, so that's one step. The second thing is, then he urges them to live in that reality. Remember, we are positionally holy. Then he urges them to live in that reality by not letting sin continue to control their actions and to be in continuous repentance. In Ephesians 4 verse 1, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Count yourselves. This is in Romans 6 verse 11 to 14. This is also Apostle Paul. Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life, justification, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is the command to every justified believer. Romans 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. We are all, as justified believers, to be living sacrifices to God, holy and acceptable to Him. So, we may be asked any question, and some of us know the answer, but I'll, for the sake of everyone, I would say it. So what happens if we, as justified believers, continue to sin willfully? According to Hebrews 10, verse 26 to 30. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. 
Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified as a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. That's all in scripture, that's not my words. We therefore cannot continue in willful sin. God will judge us. We must submit ourselves to the process of sanctification and repent of sin. When God commands us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, he is talking about submitting ourselves to the process of continuous sanctification. He calls us to be holy as he is holy. We cannot therefore just stop our justification or be even satisfied with the sanctification, whatever bit of sanctification we have received, because God actually promises us complete sanctification. The word repent comes from the Greek word metanoeo, and refers to a change of mind of a purpose formed, or of something the person, a person has done, or a reversal of a decision. Repentant isn't there, repentant, sorry, isn't therefore just about saying you repent. It's say to repent. I repent of sin, Lord. I repent of sin. I repent for the unforgiveness. I repent for the fornication. I repent for the masturbation. I repent for the adultery. I repent, Lord. I repent, oh God, for the gossip and the slander. Lord, I repent. No. Repentance is turning away from the sin. Sometimes we don't even have to say anything. You know? Because... Our mind has been removed, renewed, sorry. So, I was supposed to put something on the stand saying some sin, fornication or something. Right? So, we are walking down the road to sin. We are just, I'm a justified believer. Walking down the road to sin. God gives me repentance. It's a turning away and walking towards holiness. Walking towards eternal life. Had I continued down that road, I would have been walking fornication, fornication, fornication into eternal damnation, right? So this is why I need to make it very real to you all. And that's why I want to show you what exactly is happening when we continue in willful sin. The Bible says, so you all saw the turning, right? I went this way and I turned my entire being, this living sacrifice, the temple of the Holy Spirit, turned totally it wasn't like one foot here and a walk in and a, you know, the whole being turned, right? I didn't do like Lot's wife and looked back at the fornication. I continued walking this way. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And this is in Romans 6 verse 23. But God promises us the gift of eternal life if we turn away from sin. We work, let's use a practical example. All of us here work. We work, and at the end of the month, we get money, right, for the work that we've done. Likewise, we engage in willful sin, and what do we get? Spiritual death. Amen. We cannot continue. You all understand the seriousness of this, right, of willful sin. We cannot continue to play patty cake with our souls. It is precious to God. Our souls are precious to God. And it should also be precious to us. We are so careful with other possessions. We handle our drink, drinking glasses. I get a drinking glass that kind of looks like Rev Zone. We handle our drink. I wouldn't just drop this drinking glass just so. I will hold it carefully and place it nicely right here. So we handle our drinking glasses with care so that they do not break. We carry our cars for servicing so that they work at optimum level. We clean our homes, etc. Why then can't we be careful with our own souls, which are much more precious than these? We must, saints, take stock of how we are living. So we say we are Christ followers. 
We've been justified. Hallelujah. How can we truly say that we are Christ followers when we, in fact, do not follow Christ or seek continually to be more like him? Now, this is no condemnation to anyone here. This is just truth, right? You all heard me read a lot of scriptures. I still have a lot more scriptures to read. And I'm just obeying the Lord as he leads his servant. So, what is the willful sin that we are engaging in? Is it watching pornography or other shows that defile the eyes or, and the mind? Because this temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So are we defiling the Holy Spirit that lives in us? Are we defiling? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing, uh, you know, a child in a room. And all around the room is just chaos. The parents argue and they're shouting, they're screaming. And the child is just like, all I wanted was a safe place to develop. This is what we do when the Holy Spirit lives in us and we defile this temple. And you know, when we, because I, again, I was, I, I used to struggle with a lot, <laughs> a lot of things. And it was when God showed me, this is the, this is the temple, this is your, the Holy Spirit actually does live here. There's certain things I just could not do again. It was like conviction from heaven that came down. So, are we entertaining envy and jealousy? Is the willful sin, bitterness, unforgiveness, keeping a record of wrongs against someone? Is it not loving unconditionally? We say we love, but do we really love? Is it pride? Is it fornication? Is it not telling the whole truth or telling a half truth, aka lying? Is it gossiping and slandering the brother or sister? or even those outside the body of Christ? Is it masturbation? Are we idolizing people? Are we idolizing our phones? Are we idolizing social media? Are we idolizing ourselves? I'm speaking now to the husbands. Are you loving your wives as Christ loves the church? I'm speaking to the wives. Are you submitting to your husbands? Has God, okay, so aside from the list, right? Has God spoken to any of us about a certain thing, yet still we refuse to obey? In James 4 verse 7, it says, If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Luke 6 verse 46 says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? We must be exuding more and more of the fruit of the Spirit. We must become more loving to each other, more joyful, more patient, more peaceful, more kind, displaying more goodness, more faithful, more gentle, and have more self-control. Sin should not have a constant hold on us. What does the Word of God say about our lives, the way we dress, our speech, and how we treat each other? Disobedience to, God, disobedience to God and his word is sin. We have to take stock, saints. Sin is what separates us from God and leads us to eternal damnation with our saved selves. The prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 20 verse 8 had this to say to the people of Israel who rebelled against God. And just as we are chosen, they also were God's chosen people. And this is in Ezekiel 20 verse 8 as I said. But they rebelled against me and were not willing to listen to me. They did not cast away the detestable things of their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I resolved to pour out my wrath on them, to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Just as he did with the Israelites, God will not tolerate sin in us. We must repent of known sin. There are things that we know God has given us the strength to overcome. And there are things that we need help to overcome. Where we have the strength to submit to God and resist the devil, we must not give in to the sin. God has given many of us, if we recount, a way of escape when faced with the temptation to sin. You do not have to sin, but sometimes we choose to sin. 
Repentance is a work of the Holy Spirit. God is the one who grants repentance as seen in 2 Timothy 2 verse 25 to 26. He knows the deep and hidden and, not so, and the not so deep and hidden sins that exist in our hearts. We cannot judge ourselves. Sometimes we could, and I will talk about that later. We cannot judge ourselves. We must go before him and ask him to show us the sin that is in our hearts. Matthew 15 verse 19 says, For out of the heart, sin is in the heart. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. So it's in our heart. Jeremiah 17 verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. I remember once, very recently, I was before the Lord, and I felt so sanctimoniously holy. Because in my mind, I knew my heart, right? I was just like, man, God, I'm in heaven already, yes? She generated, man, what is that? Sinful nature, what is that? <laughs> However, I was humble enough, though, to say to the Lord, and I can't even say it's my humility. I think God, by his mercy, reminded me of what his word said. So I said to him, I said, Lord, you said in your word that if any man says that he is without sin, he is a liar. So Lord, show me my heart. And God is so faithful. We sang today about the faithfulness of God immediately the Lord began to minister to me about a particular sin that I was engaging in. I didn't know about it before, but I went to him because he shows us our heart. Saints, God does not want us to be stuck in our sin. Or else he wouldn't show us. He will leave us, right? He will keep us blinded. He will show us, but we must make the time for him to show us. We can't be so busy with our temporary lives on this earth that we don't have enough time to invest in our eternal lives. Eternity is forever. If we get even 60 years on this earth, we are lucky. Aside from this, tomorrow is promised to no one. So you could predict, well, 60 years, 70 years, but the true and in fact, tomorrow is not promised to anyone. If you die today, and this is, I'm going to pause a little bit for you all to really think and ask the Lord to show you. If you die today, where are you going? I saw a movie called The Rapture. And it was in church. People were in church. And they were bawling down the place, crying. Because the rapture had occurred. And there were those that were left behind. Right? So... If you were to die today, and please, don't do like me at first and say, my heart, good man. Ask God. God, if I were to die today, where am I going? Okay? Some of us are constantly working, busy with family, busy with friends, busy with significant other, others, busy with social media, busy with our own interests, busy with sleep even, and have no or little time for God. God is a low priority item on our list because we believe he understands, but we are in fact in deception. How do you expect God to show us and deal with our sin if we have no time for him? Many, including myself, experience breakthrough after breakthrough, week after week at tarrying. Tarrying is not, I have understood very recently, Tarrying is not a life and life ministry thing, you know. It is spending, simply spending time in his presence corporately, worshiping, being prayed for, and hearing his word. Can anyone here, though, attest to having received breakthrough at tarrying when now you are more walking more like Christ? I want to see some hands. Yeah. Anybody? Right. So, saints, we must make time, right? You see the breakthroughs. So you spend time. Time plus, <laughs> let me do some maths. I'm a lawyer. Lawyers <laughs> hate maths, let me tell you. Time plus his presence equals breakthrough. Amen. Right? And time is a gift from God that has been given to us. 
He will do, and I want to give you all this hope, eh? He will do that work in us. In 2 Peter 3 verse 9, God says that his desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We, including myself at the time, think, sometimes think that this applies only to the unsaved, but this applies to us. If we don't repent, we perish, and sin is rooted in unbelief. If we recognize that our problem is that we don't believe we are to live holy lives, or we don't believe that sin is as bad as God says that it is, then we need to cry out to God, Lord, help my unbelief. I have cried out that prayer so many times because sometimes I read something in the Word and it does nothing. Like I'm like, God, really? <laughs> right? But he answers. He would not, not listen to your cry. Lord, help my unbelief. He doesn't want you to stay in that state of being stuck. You can't you're so bound up that you can't move forward. He doesn't want that. He wants you to just come to him transparent. God is not like other human beings where you know, oh gosh, let me make sure I'm, you know, wearing my suit today. I have on my glasses. You know, let me put on a good front. Nobody know what going, what I just experienced at home. No, 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 no. God wants us bears naked. When, in fact, if you all remember, when Adam sinned, Adam went and hiding, and God went looking for him. God knew where he was, eh? God asked him, Adam, why are you hiding? Why? <laughs> There's no need. I am God. I created you. I love you. You know, I created you for a purpose. Why are you hiding? Come to me. You know, sometimes God put people in our lives to help us, like our pastors, and we would not at all tell our pastors what we're struggling with. Oh, Rev, everything is fine. <laughs> everything is fine. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. I am blessed and highly favored, God. I'm Rev. But we have to be honest, right? She is discipling us. Our pastors are discipling us. Let's just be honest. I mean, let me tell you, the kind of things I tell our pastor. <laughs> like, but it helps because, you know, you need, you know, you need the brethren to be able to point out things and to help, right? Our pastors are well equipped to help us. That's what they're called to do. So we have to be honest. You know, it's not about looking for their approval, looking, making sure we look nice in their eyes. What is that? What is that? Okay, can we be real? Can we be real? So, if, uh, so we have to become desperate saints. God will help us, but he is waiting on us to come to him with transparency and to come to those who... Um, is there to help us with transparency. When we, his people, choose not to repent, we, what we're actually doing is rejecting Jesus. Imagine that, huh? a justified believer rejecting Jesus. And it grieves him when we reject him. Yes, a saved person, as I said, can still reject Jesus. When we disobey him and live how we want, we are rejecting his ways. When the people of Jerusalem rejected Jesus as the coming Messiah, we read that Jesus wept over the city due to the impending judgment that he knew was at hand. The theologians have said that this weeping was more like a deep, deep wailing. And this is how Jesus feels when we choose not to repent. Why? Because he knows that the wages of our sin is eternal death. Is the sin that we engage in, saints, really worth it? We must take stock of our lives because time really is very short. The Lord then says this to you today in 2 Peter 3. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. 
By these waters also, the world of that time was de deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. We must be there. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawlessness and fall from your secure position, your secure position in him when you became saved. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Romans 6, I'm almost finished. Well then, should we keep on sinning? This is City Justified Believer. Well then, should we keep on sinning? This is Paul again. So that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. He was resurrected for our purpose. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument. This is all scripture reading. That is not my words. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master. Okay? You don't have to sin. Sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, 
Does that mean we can go on sinning? The question comes again. Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? That's why some of us real type like a market crab. Because we keep going back and going back and going back to the sin. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to a righteous living. Thank God. Once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey his teaching we have given you. And that's, how we need to, that's where we need to get. Now you are free from your slavery to sin. And you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slavery, slave, sorry, to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. Apostle Paul was a bond servant of Christ. We also need to be born servants of Christ. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do. I can tell you, I'm real ashamed of some of the things I used to do. Crazy. Things that end in eternal doom. One of the things I will just share with you all to tell you how, I mean, sin really could did cause you to be so disillusioned. I had an alcoholic, alcohol addiction. Every party I went to, I had to drink alcohol in order to have fun and get drunk. And there was a time where I was driving home because I always wanted to drive. And I drove, a, drove the wrong way around the savannah. It's foolishness, real foolishness, right? So I am very much ashamed. <laughs> and there were people in the car with me. So it wasn't even me putting myself in harm's way. I was putting everybody else in the car in harm's way. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. John Owen says, Repentance is that which carries the believing soul through all his failures, infirmities, and sins. He is not able to live one day without the constant exercise of it is as necessary unto the continuance of spiritual life as faith is. It is that continual, habitual self-abasement which arises from a sense of the majest majesty and holiness of God and the consciousness of our miserable failures. James Montgomery Boy says, It is impossible to follow Christ without repentance. How could it be otherwise? Jesus is the holy, sinless Son of God. He has never taken one step in any sinful direction. He has never had a single sinful thought. Anyone who is following him, therefore, must, by definition, turn his back to sin and set his face toward righteousness. Christians do sin, but when they do, they must confess their sin and turn from it, being restored to fellowship again. Anyone who thinks he or she can follow Christ without renouncing sin is at best, at best, badly confused. At the worst, the person is not a true Christian. Ezekiel 18, verse 30 to th verses 30 to 32 says to us, Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. Thank you.